Right? Everything we do in our culture, reward is based on how we perform, or rejection is based on our lack of performance, right? And we, teach, we learn this at a young age. So kindergartners, they go, they understand a report card, and based on how well they perform, they get rewarded. We take this into the sports environment, right? How we perform determines whether or not we win. You take it into your jobs, whether or not you get a job, and whether or not you get promoted within your job is determined by how well you perform. But what if God does that counterculturally? What, what if God doesn't give us or deny us a relationship with Him, not so much on our performance, but something else? That's what we're going to launch into next week. The whole series is going to be rooted in Luke chapter 15. So if you have a Bible, we, we'll give you one if you don't this morning, but if you have a Bible, feel free to spend some time getting ready for that series next week. And now what I want to do is introduce you guys to Daniel Blackaby. One of the things we believe in here at Epic is leadership development. And so that's not just like, hey, we don't just ask our volunteers and Epic Kids or our hospitality team to reproduce themselves. Even from the very top of our church, we want to be able to reproduce ourselves. And so Daniel is a student at Golden Gate Seminary. He is heading toward this, this world of ministry and already been involved in it. Daniel has his first book coming out in June. And so I'm going to pray, and then Daniel's going to do the first uh, portion of our Rhythm of Learning message, and then I'll do the back half. So would you guys pray with me for Daniel, and then we'll begin our teaching time this morning. God, I thank you uh, for the fact that you give your church gifts, and every man and woman in this room, Father, you've given them uh, a unique passion. God, you've given them skills. God, for the Christians in this room, you've given us a spiritual gift. And God, I thank you for the gifts you've displayed in Daniel's lives, and in Daniel's life, God, and in the, um, the experiences he's had up until this point. God, as, as he gets ready to teach us, I pray that you would uh, give him clarity of mind and of thought and speech. God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us through him. And so, God, I pray you'll bless the teaching, both the first portion and, and the back half this morning. And God, I pray that what we learn in the next few moments will be critical to our growth as individuals and our growth as a church. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Give it up for Daniel. Well, I just want to thank Ben just for the opportunity to, to share the stage with him and, and really just thank you guys all for being here. And this is the awesome privilege it is for me to really to share an area that kind of where I'm at, where God's really been teaching me in my life personally. I want me to start off by saying that um, never in history has a single book spurred so much controversy, had so much influence, or marched so radically against the status quo of our world as the Bible. And uh, whether maybe you grew up reading the children's Bible, or maybe you're just checking this out for the first time, I think we all have some kind of stigma that we attach to the word Bible. And for some of us, it's a positive thing we think of... Uh, absolute truth, the holy word of God. And for some of us, it might be a negative thing. We might um, see the word Bible as synonymous with a tedious list of thou shall nots or um, something along that lines. But uh, really today, I just want to really ask ourselves the question, what is the Bible? Why, why is the Bible important to us today? Is it important to us? Um, how do we read the Bible? And then lastly, what would it look like if we allowed the Bible to transform our lives? Um, on that note, if you don't have a Bible today, if you'd be willing just to put up your hand, and some of the ushers will be coming through the aisles, and we'd be happy to give you a Bible. And this is a, a gift from Epic Church to you, um, to keep, you can take home. Um, the passage we're going to be in today is Psalms um, 1, verses 1 to 3. Um, and if you have one of the Epic Bibles, it's going to be on page 384. Um, we're going to be walking back through the text throughout, but um, let me just read it for you um, as we begin. It says... Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all he does, he prospers. Um, well, for those of you who don't know me that well, um, I grew up in a snowy western Canada, where we like to say that we have 11 months of winter and one month of bad skiing. Um, so you can understand why I was ecstatic when recently my family got the opportunity to take a holiday to Hawaii. And as we showed up um, to the condo of our beach house, I quickly threw my um, suitcase in the room, changed into my swim shorts, and made the quick five minute dash to the beach. Um, and about an hour later, when the rest of my family finally caught up, um, my dad informed me that while I'd been laying on the beach, he'd um, stopped by the grocery store and picked up a bunch of my favorite snacks for the, for, to, to enjoy the holidays. So, again, leaving my family behind once again, I made the five-minute dash back to the condo to find this food. 
dashed through the front door, and true to his words, sitting on the kitchen counter was a bag of double-stuffed mint Oreos, a jumbo bag of Doritos, and a two-liter bottle of Diet Coke. Um, scooping them into my arms, and without bothering to change under my swim shorts, I plopped myself into the couch, I threw my feet up onto the table, I turned the TV on, a hockey game was on, um, and I was thinking as a Canadian, this is the perfect life. I looked down at the, the hordes of food in my lap, I looked out, my favorite sport was on TV, I looked to my left to see the man standing there in a towel, I looked to my right, I looked back to my left, <laughs> where a big man was standing there in a little towel, with <laughs> a very confused look on his face. And I looked back to the soaking wet couch, which is now crusted in a layer of crumbs. And I looked up to the table, which is now covered in gobby sand. And I looked to the four missing sleeves of double stuffed mint Oreos. And in that moment, I realized I was in the wrong condo. <laughs> well, you know, um, hopefully none of you have to experience the emotionally scarring experience like I had. But you know, it's, it's really easy to get, to get lost in life. If we're just kind of going through life, taking it as it comes, it's really easy just to um, one day just wake up and look around and just ask yourself, how did I get here? What, what led me to this point? Um, well, really, um, what we see in this passage that I'm going to be teaching from today is that the Bible warns us about this lifestyle. Um, the first um, point, I guess, is that I see in the passage is that we read the Bible because it liberates us from ourselves. Um, I want to let's look at the first verse, if we can get it up on the screen. And really, I just want to draw attention to the, to the three verbs in this uh, verse, because I think it creates a very vivid mental picture. Um, it says, Blessed is the man who, walk, who walks not um, in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of the scoffers. And do you notice just the downward spiral of movement in this passage? From walking, um, finding our way, moving to standing, to eventually just, um, sitting still um, with the scoffers, with the cynics, um, bitter at perhaps the way it turned out. Well, the Bible says, blessed is the man who avoids this way of life, who avoids this going through life um, without direction. Um, you know, and I think, I think we see this in our world all the time. I think... Um, interesting enough, I found just the other day that a few years ago, Forbes magazine published an article which um, rated that San Francisco was the top spot in all of America for young college um, graduates to move, citing this the possibility, the hopeful chances of success. Well, I found another article that was published in that same month that um, talked about the Golden Gate Bridge being the number one location in the whole world for suicide. And uh, this paradox of the same location being this, the, um, defined by hope also simultaneously serves as a hub for the epitome of, epitome of hopelessness. And uh, I think we see this paradox in society all the time. Um, the ones who've, who've reached the goals that we're, that we're striving after, the ones who've made it, are, so often they're the ones that are seeking the most desperately for something more. Um, and why is this? Um, could it be that the world perhaps isn't falling through on all its promises. It's not making us happy. Um, well, you know, what about us? I know I'm, my personality, I set a lot of goals for myself, and then I set goals to help me reach the goals, and goals to help me remember the goals. And, um, but you know, the thing I find about us when we set goals is that um, we are very militant at setting goals of what we want to do in our lives. We have goals for, you know, maybe where we want to move, what, we want to, what job we want, what we want to accomplish, maybe a goal to get married. Um, but I find that we're, we're a lot more lax when it comes to setting goals for who we want to be in our life. Um, what, what goals do we have? What, what direction are we taking to what kind of husband we want to be? What kind of wife? Um, you know, maybe what kind of son we want to be? What kind of um, friend do we want to be? What kind of neighbor? Do we, do we have goals? Um, do we have direction in this area? Or, or are we simply just kind of going through life, um, searching, um, taking the opportunities in front of us and just kind of waiting for our circumstances to shape us um, and mold us into this person. And I just want to ask you, is, this, is that the best way to do it? Um, I think you just look at the long history's track record of, of just loneliness and just the epidemic of broken relationships. And I think it's pretty clear that this way of, of life just isn't cutting it for people. Um, but that brings us to verse 2 of the passage. And let me just tell you, verse 2 is really good news. Um, Verse 2, this really pumps me up. It, 
It says, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he, ded- or he meditates day and night. And really, I just want to clarify the word law that's used here. The actual, um, in the original language that it was written in Hebrew, that word doesn't necessarily mean like constitutional law. It really has the, I- the idea, it captures the thought of uh, guidance. Or, but his delight is in the instruction, the direction of the Lord. And also, um, the word delight. Um, if I were to ask you what the first thought that comes into your head when you think of reading the Bible, is delight, would delight be that word? Or would delight um, would be, come up at all in your mind? Um, I just want to say, God isn't asking us, he's not giving us the Bible so that he can have obedient followers, so that it's going to be a tedious thing that we have to read the Bible every day. He's, he's giving it to us so we can really delight in it. I think if you tie it back to verse 1, Blessed is, it's really what it's trying to say is, blessed is the man who doesn't fall victim to this uh, directionless way of life, because he delights in finding something so much better. And uh, I just want to say, what does that, what does that mean for us? Um, how do we delight in the, in the law of the Lord, in the direction of the Lord? Um, well, the word meditate, it's really probably not a word we use a whole lot anymore. Um, when I say meditate, we probably have a bunch of different thoughts that come into our head. Some of you may th- be thinking of yoga, or I don't know how you can meditate when your body's bent like that, but um, for some of you, maybe you think of like a wise man. You think of Pastor Ben, you know, floating on top of a mountain, thinking deep thoughts, and the sun, you know, shining out of his bald head. And, uh, but really, the best definition I've ever heard for the word meditate was um, from my grandpa. He's a very wise man, and um, this is what he said about meditation. He said, to- meditating is keeping a-, a verse, keeping a truth of God in front of you long enough for it to become a reality in your life. Um, and I think a, a lot of you can probably relate, probably you guys especially, um, you know, you go to Ikea, you buy a kitchen, ta- or a kitchen table, you bring it home, take one quick glance at the front cover picture of the instructions, set it aside, and then about half an hour later you're staring at a lopsided bookshelf. <laughs> and you're wondering, you know, what went wrong? And I want me to say that Um, It's good to have a Bible. It's great to have a Bible. I hope you all got a Bible if you needed one. But just having a Bible isn't going to change your life. And uh, it's good to read the Bible, and I hope that we're all reading the Bible. But simply reading the Bible isn't necessarily going to change our life. Um, Our lives will be changed when we begin to let the Bible transform us and let our our actions um, begin to be molded by the Bible. Um, And really, that's what it says. After it says, meditate on day and night, I don't want that to scare anyone about, you know, you got to read the Bible every single morning, every single night, or you're not going to heaven. Um, that's not what it's saying at all. What it's really saying is that when you meditate on it, when you let it begin to conform, um, transform you, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect the way you live from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you lay your head back on your pillow at night. And the way you make decisions, and the way you do relationships, and the values you have, um, when you really begin to let it transform you, it's going to transform every part of your life. Um, and the third thing I just want to say is we've kind of seen you know, why we need direction and I, um, it tells us how to, how to get that direction but I just want to ask, what does it look like? Um, if, we, if we do this, if we uh, allow the Bible to transform us, what does that really mean for us? Um, it's the, verse 3 in the passage says that um, the one who um, rejects this way, direction, this way of life is transformed, transformed by the Bible it says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all he does, he prospers. And this, this metaphor used of this tree by the stream of water is probably one that um, falls a bit flat in our own society. In our own, it doesn't have the same emphasis that it probably did back when it was written. And um, I actually had a, a chance to go to Israel not long ago, and uh, just driving through the, in, in the Jeep, doing a little tour, and you just look out over... Um, this desert, as far as you can see, um, rocks, there's not a bit of greenery to be found, until you come across a stream, or until you come across a river, and you find these lush green trees, this um, towering up into the sky, and it's, um, really that's the context that this was written, it's, it's saying that apart from the stream, apart from the river, there is no life, um, you know, anything that does grow, it, it eventually just withers in the heat, and it dies, only the stuff that's connected the roots into the stream um, last. And really, um, I think that's what it's saying about the Bible, um, when we're connected into it, when we're transformed by it. Um, 
And also, I think the, it says that it produces fruit in its season. And this might sound really childish, or, but um, a tree doesn't need its own fruit. Um, you probably don't need me to tell you that, but um, fruit is for the, really for the benefit of others. And I think what this verse is doing is it's, it's contrasting back to the, the first verse where you have, you have someone sitting with the scoffers, bitter, cynical, wondering how their life ended up this way. And it's saying that in contrast, you have overflowing life that this, your fruit coming out of you and it's, um, you know, your, your spouses, your friends, your co-workers are the ones benefiting just from this abundance of life. Um, well, so what does this look like in our life? Uh, I, like I said, I grew up in Canada and where I grew up, um, we were just a few hours away from the biggest indoor amusement park in North America. And uh, in this amusement park was the Red Roller Coaster, which is um, the biggest indoor roller coaster in North America. And uh, people literally died on this thing when it first came out. Um, it's a towering structure. Um, well, every year my family would take a trip to this amusement park, and my dad would take me and my brother, and we'd have tons of fun spinning in the little teacups, and we'd be riding the yellow roller coaster, which you know kind of goes up the little speed bumps and then goes back in a little circle. And um, as we'd be riding these rides, we every few minutes we just hear just the whoosh and just the screaming as the red roller coaster went down this big drop. And uh, every every year, my dad would take me and my brother and bring us up to just to stare at this structure and say, "You guys ready to ride this ride? You guys want to go on it? Are you guys ready?" And, and every year it was kind of, well, maybe next year. It's probably not a good time. It's getting late. Uh, Mom is probably waiting, you know. Um, and every year we'd come back and we'd hear this the whoosh of the roller coaster. And my dad would take us and ready, are you ready to ride it? And well, maybe next time. And, well, I still remember um, very clearly the day I had a psychotic breakdown, I guess. And I remember my dad took us, are you ready to ride this ride? And I, I would say, yeah, no, I'm, I'm ready. Let, let's do it. So I remember just how terrified I was as it climbed higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and way up into the, um, to the top of to the roof and you see little specks below you of the people walking around and, and then it hinges on the top and just grab and hold as tight as you can and then this whoosh as it went down that final drop and this screaming like a girl, um, <laughs> this, um, you know, riding the ride and after the two minutes was done I remember um, after they finally peeled my fingers off the handlebar, um, just the excitement I felt, and this, this, the, the rush of adrenaline I felt, and I just remember saying, Dad, let's do it again, let's get in line, let's do it again, let's ride this ride, it's, and I remember um, just feeling so excited about this experience I just had, and you know, it's really interesting that um, we continue to go back to that amusement park every year, <laughs> um, but to this day, I've never ridden in a another spinning teacup, or, um, you know, I've never, I kind of, I'd walk past the yellow roller coaster and just kind of shake my head and say, you know, that, I thought that was fun, I, I've got on speed bumps that are more exciting than that, and, um, you know, once I experienced that, that red roller coaster, it's everything else that I thought was making me happy, everything I thought was so much fun, really I realized this wasn't a very big deal compared to this, this new joy I'd found. Um, I just want to say, the Bible, God didn't give us the Bible to try and get us in bondage. Um, let's face, God's not getting royalties from how many Bibles we sell. Um, you know, God's not, he doesn't want more just servants to be robots and read his Bible. God's given us this Bible because he knows what the alternative is when we're just going through life on our own. Um, he knows where, he knows the destination, and he wants to offer something so much better. Um, and this is second, Ben's going to come up and just kind of, continue this, this thought, but I really just want to challenge you guys that, um, I don't know where you, know, where you are in this process, but um, God's offering you something so exciting, this way of life that's so radical against um, our society, and um, I just want to ask you, where are you in your life? Are you, what direction do you have? Or, you know, as far as who you want to be, where you're going, and could it be that, you know, just in front of you is something offered you that's so much more than you're experiencing? And really all it takes is that step of faith, is to dive in. You know, as scary as it is, um, as hard as it might be, it's just, let me just tell you from experience that it's so worth it. And it's not Ben come up from time. Great. Thanks, Amy. Come up for Dan. You know, you know, one of the things that's becoming increasingly clear to me is that we have tons of intelligent people in our church. 
And so when I'm meeting with you guys for coffee or dinner, or I'm getting emails from people, and I just look at where their email address is, I'm like, oh, they didn't get that job unless they're brilliant. And it's becoming increasingly clear to me that there are tons of smart people. Now, you might wonder where you're at on that scale. Let me tell you, that's a great thing. There are going to be opportunities for us as a church that we're going to need collective knowledge and wisdom in this room and experience to move forward. We're going to need your intellect. We're going to need your help. There's a great gift that God's given us by giving us intelligent people. But let me also tell you one that's very dangerous. The reason why it's very dangerous for our church to be full of intelligent people is that more than likely, we will be prone to rest on our own knowledge and wisdom and skill and experience. And what we will move away from, what we will get distance from, is this dependence on God. Listen, I am not smart enough to start a church that can do well in downtown San Francisco. I needed to depend on God when this thing began. Well, now, man, people are coming, and it's great, and small groups are going, and there's over 70 adults, and we've got 60 people serving in the church. Guess what I never need to move away from? Whether we have 10 or 100 or 1,000 people involved in our church, and what you and I both never need to move away from is the wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom that's greater than the knowledge you have. It's greater than the sum total of your experience. It's greater than all the combined and collective wisdom in this room. And God gives it to us freely. And so what I want to hammer on just a few minutes is how do we develop a rhythm of gaining wisdom? Proverbs chapter 4, it's just one book over from Psalms. So if you were there, we're going to have that on the screen as well. Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 5. So Proverbs was written by Solomon as well as some, some other people. And just some incredible, wise truths. Whether you're not even a Christian in this room, there's great knowledge and truth in this for you. And if you are a Christian, God really downloads so much of what he's revealed himself to Solomon and others. Back really between 600 to 1,000 years or so before, before Jesus ever came is when these words went into existence from, from the pen of Solomon as well as some other guys. And listen to what he says. And I want you to think about, we're, we're finishing this rhythm series, right? So we had developing a rhythm of prayer, developing a rhythm of generosity. And now let's talk a few moments about developing a rhythm of gaining wisdom. So in verse 5 of Proverbs 4, he lays this out. He says, get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, he's referring to wisdom, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. So he begins by telling us what wisdom. So what I want to do, really, just walk through three scenarios for us. The first one is this. Why get wisdom? Why get wisdom? And, and he just, again, walking through the passage. The first one it says is that wisdom will keep you. And wisdom will guard you. And no matter how smart you are in this room, you need wisdom to guard you. When left to ourselves, we're not nearly as well off as most of us think. Right? There's some really bright people in this room. There's lots of us in this room. Well, I wouldn't be in that category, but another category. There's lots of us in this room that have had many experiences, and we've learned from those experiences. And so we think, you know what? Left to myself, left to me and my associates, left to me and my spouse, left to me and my friends. I've got this thing figured out. And the first thing it says is wisdom is the thing that will keep you. Wisdom is the thing that will guard you. It will even guard you from becoming prideful about how much knowledge that you have. So it keeps you, and it says that it guards you. And then look at, verse, look at verse 7. He says, the beginning of wisdom is this. He's going to say, if you get anything, the wisest thing for you to do. And then it says, if you get anything, verse 7, get insight or get wisdom. When I asked Shauna's parents if I could marry her, it was a package thing. Like, I needed to ask both of them. So I found this one moment in, in, on a night. Shauna was gone with her sisters, and I just said to her dad, well, I didn't just say it. I mean, I'm pacing for 25 minutes, and he comes back, and he's ready to go to a high school basketball game. And I said, hey, can I ask you something? And so I just laid it on him. Hey, can I marry your daughter? And then he gives me this grand speech about how precious she is to him. If you ask for my truck, maybe I'll give it to you, but you've asked for my daughter. She's a treasure, blah, blah, blah. Just say yes or no. I don't really care. You can say yes or no at this point. I'm, I'm good either way in this moment. <laughs> And so anyway, he, he says yes, and then Shauna's mom comes in, and he says, Phyllis, that's Shauna's mom saying, Phyllis, uh, Ben just asked, and she's like, oh, that's so exciting, and she starts talking about when the wedding can be, and 
I'm just hyperventilating, and the three of us ride to the high school basketball game where Shauna's little sister was cheering. So it's Shauna's dad in the front seat. I only met them less than a month ago. Context is huge here, okay? I've known these people less than a month. We're clear on that before we move on? Shauna's dad's in the front, driving. Shauna's mom's driving shotgun. I'm in the back. I'm still red, I'm sure, nervous, uh, parched throat. And Shauna's mom says, Ben, do you know what the main thing is to keep a marriage going? I'm like, her dad's a pastor. It's going to be something like, you've got to keep God in the center of it, or you've got to be very grace-filled and forgiving or merciful, something like that. Well, none of that came out of her mouth. So, again, I want to just give you the question. Ben, do you know what you've got to do to keep a marriage going strong? I've known these people less than a month. Her dad's driving the car. His baby. All right? You with me? And her mom says, you have got to keep the passion burning. <laughs> what? She's like, out of all the things, right? If you get any, basically like Solomon saying here, if you need, if you get anything, get insight, get wisdom. She's like, Ben, if you get anything, keep the passion burning. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe she just said that to me. I met her. I mean, again, her mom there, one thing. Her dad, quite another story. He would threaten me later. Um, and uh, but Solomon's going here. If you get anything, get wisdom. So many of us, we have this, and like Daniel said, of goals, we have things that we are pursuing after. But most of us, let's just be honest, because you're like me in some ways at least, most of us aren't getting after and pursuing wisdom. Most of us have bought into a belief system that says if you have this, 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 and this, you're good. And the wisest man who ever lived, ever lived, yes, I, I know you weren't allowed back then to be compared to, but you don't win, okay? You don't win this argument with Solomon. The wisest man who ever lived, he didn't say, and he had all the stuff you can imagine. He had many, many wives, many, many wives, and then had plenty of other women that would sleep with him who weren't his wives, all right? He had it all in terms of what you could get in this world. And so what we do, we say, if I get this, that's number one. If I get this, this, and this, life is good. And the wisest person says, if you can get anything, if you can pursue anything, if you can be better off with adding anything to your life, to your portfolio, to, to what you have invested, get wisdom. If you get anything, get wisdom. It says if you value wisdom, right? If you prize wisdom in verse 8, she will exalt you. If you honor, if she will honor you if you embrace her. Get wisdom. Wisdom will do for you what your IQ cannot do for you. I don't care what it is. Wisdom will give you what your bank account cannot give you. Wisdom will deliver what the latest self-help book will not deliver. And I think there are some good things out there. But chase. If you're going to chase after something, chase after wisdom. Chase after the wisdom that God has. God is a revealer, as we just learned in the Bible. We'll talk about that in a moment. So why get wisdom? Because it is to be prized above all else. Secondly, how do you get it? Well, Daniel mentioned the first one, engage the scriptures, right? Get into the Bible, and we'll give you just some, some plans when we end here this morning about where you can start and, and kind of where you can find your place and dive in as he recommended to you. Engage the scriptures. The second one is to engage in prayer asking for wisdom. Isn't that a novel theme? Engage in prayer asking for wisdom. I want to show you a verse in the New Testament, James chapter 1, verse 5. This is very encouraging to us, if we could have that. James 1, 5. The, the Jews have been dispersed, right? There's persecution going on. And James is talking to them about having faith in the midst of trials. And then this verse comes next. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom. Now, some of you are trying to go, is that me? Let me just help you out. Are we ready? It's you. And it's you. And it's you. And it's you. And it's me. It, they, they, there is, every one of us in this room lacks wisdom in some area. Right? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm just going to tell you, it's you. It's me. There are areas of our lives where we lack the kind of godly wisdom that we need to have to make the right decisions. If any of you lacks wisdom, here's the good part. Let him ask God. We talked about generosity last week. Let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. One of the greatest things that you can pray for is not that you get the job, though that's a good prayer. Not that you get healed, though that's a good prayer. One of the greatest things you and I can pray for is that God would give us wisdom in the things that we're dealing with. You need relational wisdom in the room this morning. You need financial wisdom. You need emotional wisdom. You need physical wisdom. You need wisdom about how to connect to God. You need wisdom about how to let go of your past. You need wisdom about how to endure while you're suffering with whatever you're suffering with. Every single one of us in this room needs wisdom in some realm of our lives. 
Here's a beautiful thing. God says ask. And he doesn't give it sparingly. He doesn't just go, eh, there's a drop. You take care of the rest. It says, let him ask God who gives wisdom generously to all without reproach and will be given him. The third one, it says, there's lots of ways to get wisdom, but the three I want to really focus on are engage the scriptures, engage in prayer, asking for wisdom. And the third one is engage in relationships with people who are further along the faith journey. Let me give a disclaimer first. Sometimes I make the great mistake of going to this one before, before the first two. It's a lot easier for me to dial one of you on my cell phone or text you. That's really good. I don't have to listen to the things you want. You just answer my question and I move on. But sometimes it takes more effort to get in the Bible and go, you know, has God revealed truth already in this area I'm searching? Or, or to ask God in prayer, God, would you give me wisdom? So before I tell you that this is a good thing, I want to tell you, don't let this be the first thing. Right? Is it better to go to a person who's a little bit wise or to go to God who's all wise? But I have men and even women in my life that are further along different experiences along the faith journey in certain areas that I'm able to go to. Do you have these people in your life? And let me be real clear. This might be where we kind of separate part of the team here in the room. I'm not asking, do you have smart people you can go to for advice? You with me? Do you have people who have godly wisdom that you can go to for counsel? There's enough information on the internet. If we're just looking for smart answers, we, we can get them without pursuing any relationship. But do you have people, and here's what's beautiful. There aren't a whole lot of people in life, maybe you would argue you know a lot, who are all that well-rounded when it comes to wisdom. But what God's shown me is that for certain scenarios in my life, and even leading this church, there are certain men or certain women I can go to that have an expertise or they have a lot of advanced wisdom in this area. And so there's one person that I always go to if I need financial wisdom in my life. After I've done those first two things, hopefully. There's another person if it's a church leadership issue, if it's a marriage issue, if it's a parenting issue. And so you need to have people in your life that are actually, they don't have to be experts, but they need to be further along the faith journey in walking with God and having his wisdom lived out. I say this all the time about when people say something about us having good children. Well, first I say, well, you don't live with them. <laughs> Second, I say, just kidding, Elijah. Second, I say, they have an incredible mother. And it's true. And so some of you in this room who have kids, it, wouldn't be, it would be hard to have them much younger than ours, but have kids younger than ours. Uh, Shauna, you, you ask for questions, or if you're pregnant now. And so uh, people a lot of times in this room and outside of this room are saying, Shauna, how do you do this? And how do you do that? And what people, many of those people assume is that Shauna is like the, the ultimate source of this. But guess what? Shauna and I, we have people who have teenagers that we're asking all the time, how do you do this and how do you do that? And we're reading books. And, well, she's reading the books and telling me the good parts. Um, <laughs> but we have, we have wisdom places, that, places where we are seeking wisdom. And here's what's awesome. If you're going to receive wisdom from people and you're going to grow or you're one of these people who is a few steps ahead of maybe some other people, one of the things God wants to use you for is to pour wisdom back out. The best way to live life is when you have people ahead of you giving you wisdom, have people behind you on the trail that you're able to give wisdom to. Never be just a taker. Never be just a taker. Right? If you're taking the first baby steps, you're, you're, this Christianity thing's new. Hey, we want to have God's wisdom displayed through men and women in this room and in our church. But there's going to come a day, and rejoice in this, there's going to come a day where you're actually going to be able to speak into other people's lives. Because of what God puts into you and pours into you. Now the third thing is this. So we talked about why get wisdom, how to get wisdom. The third one seems very obvious, but use the wisdom that you get. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. Talking about just how to live out the Christian life, and we see this. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Here's why. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. He's saying in light of the fact that the time is short. He says if you're not careful, every time the Bible talks about wisdom, the antithesis of wisdom is always folly. Right? So you're either living a life that's wise or you're living a life that's foolish. There's not a whole lot of middle ground. You're either living in wisdom or you're living in foolishness. And you and I need to evaluate this morning in certain areas of our life, which one are we living in? Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Sometimes the issue isn't that we don't have wisdom. Sometimes the issue is that we don't act on the wisdom that we have. Sometimes God presents a way and we go, that's his way, that's his intent, that is his design, and we choose, every one of us in this room, again, inclusive here, every one of us in this room at times, we choose to go our own way, knowing it's not the way God designed life to be lived. 
And we can rationalize it away, and we can call it a bunch of different things, but let's just be honest. Here's what God calls it. Here's what it truthfully is. It's sin. Sin is anything that misses the mark on what God's intent is for it to be lived out in this life. And every one of us, your pastor included, maybe more than all of the rest, I understand at times what God has asked me to do, and in the same moment I choose to do something else. But here's the beautiful part of the story. In my foolishness, God being all wise and all loving has sent a way through Jesus for even my foolishness to be forgiven and for grace to be poured out in the places where I intentionally chose a way that wasn't his way and a way that you chose that wasn't his way. And God, through Jesus' life and death and resurrection, has poured out grace and one of the wisest things you and I can do is embrace it and embrace him. To close, I just want to say this. How many of you travel using a GPS versus just your own intellect? GPS, right here. Come on. Come on, all you intelligent people that we just slammed a second ago, give it to us. Who can, who, who's just fine without the GPS? Seriously. We need to know. I mean, we need to be friends. <laughs> That's amazing. The guy that just moved from South Africa two months ago doesn't need a GPS. <laughs> no, stop. Stop. <laughs> we really need to talk. Well, there are times, well, lots of times, last night being one of them, where my wife, she's got a great sense of direction, but I think I'll just end up where I need to end up on my own, right? And it happened last night. We, we made it home. We're back at church this morning. Just telling me, you got to get over it. I'm like, I can't get over it. I'm, I'm just going for it. And then you look for one street that you're familiar, sort of familiar with, and, and then you get on back. And, 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 you know, throughout San Francisco, I really feel like I could be put anywhere and find my way back home. It, it would be long and a lot of wasted gas, but I'm, I'm going home. Right? So I'm, I'm going to make it. One of the things I want to say in here is this, and, and, and I don't know how you'll receive this, of it, but, but I think it needs to be said. You and I, one of the wisest things to understand is that you and I don't get to dictate who God is and what's important to Him. Right? If you and I get to make our own God, then we can live really convenient lives because I can create a God who serves every need that I think I have. I can create a God who does things on my terms. And I just want to be real clear. As you, we want to encourage you, seek truth. And, and I'm having conversations all the time with people like, hey, I just don't know about Jesus. I just don't know about God. I'm like, man, seek. Ask questions. Share your doubts. Get around people that, 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 that can help process some of that. Just so long as in your seeking and in my seeking, we understand the wise thing is that we don't get to create a God who serves the purposes that we create for him. That God exists. That he has a way that he's designed us to live life but intention. For that life and what our role is to seek him. And then at some point, it's time for you and I to submit to his ways. When you come into wisdom, the question is, okay, this is clearly, you understand God has said, this is the way I intended it to be. Then you and I have got to decide, well, will we embrace his way? Or do we really think that we can choose a better way? All paths don't lead to God because you can't create a path that leads to God. God's created a path. He wants you seeking, following along that path. But you don't get to dictate and demand who he is. I don't get to dictate and demand who he is. People, you can say, but so-and-so out there been said this, and so-and-so said that. That's great, but unless they're God, I don't know that I would take it as the gospel truth. We need to be really wise with what we pay attention to. We need to be really wise with what we hold on to as truth. And we need to be really wise regardless of how smart you are. Well, I won't even say where I am. If, how, regardless of how smart you are. God's wisdom is better. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says that, that, that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and that his ways are higher than our ways. It says as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. But here's the beauty. It doesn't mean you, you're dumb. Right? God's given some of you an incredible gift of intelligence. But the beauty is that the God whose ways are higher than yours and whose thoughts are higher than yours, he gives generously to those of us in this room who ask him for it. What area in your life do you need to develop wisdom for? Perhaps God's given us his answer in the Bible in your certain area. He's given us lots of answers there. Perhaps you need to ask God, God, would you give wisdom? And perhaps you're in this room, and feel free to, to call our staff. We're not the wise people, but we know wise people. Feel, perhaps you need to find a man or woman that's a further, a little bit down the journey than you, or a couple, or whatever it may be, and go, hey, I don't know how to raise my two-year-old. We'll point you in the right direction. Or, or I don't really know where to do this or that. Find people that are further down the road than you who have generous hearts and want to invest their wisdom into your life. 
But what do you what do you need wisdom for? Is it a job thing? Is it finances? Maybe you're trying to have a baby and you don't really know how to do that. Well, apparently my wife and I are pretty fertile, so we could pass a few hands there. It's true. Pastor, pastor is keeping it straight. But seriously, what do you need wisdom for? What do you need wisdom for? The beautiful thing is you have a God who gives generously. But your role in this, admit that you don't know it all, humble yourself and ask him for it. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are a good God. God, I thank you that, that you are all wise. And God, at the same time, I admit that there are times where I sense your wisdom and I sense your truth. And I walk away from it because I think what option B is would be more pleasurable or more significant or more satisfying. God, you have blessed so many people in this room with great intellect. God, they are developing things. They are charting a new course in their technology field or business or finance or science. But God, in humility, may they be people who seek a wisdom that's greater than theirs. God, would you give us wisdom in how to, to live within our means of our finances and how to be generous in regards to them? God, would you give us wisdom for parenting and for relationships? God, would you give us wisdom in regards to leadership of fellow employees or following a boss who doesn't always do things like we think they should or, or, or leading our own people? God, would you give us clarity? God, would you give us wisdom? Help us to discern what's true and to know how to do the thing that you've called us to do in this life. God, I pray that you would, first of all, help us acknowledge we haven't always chosen your way. Sometimes out of ignorance, literally. We just didn't know. God, other times out of intentional disobedience. And yet, the Bible says that while we were still sinners, while we were still living away from you, it was in that moment, not when we got it right, but in that moment you sent Jesus for us. The Bible says that he loved us and gave himself up for us. And that is a big deal, and I pray that we would embrace you as the giver of the gift of salvation, God, and the gift of wisdom. God, help us to seek you. You're what we need. You have all wisdom, and you are God who gives it to us generously. May we seek you for wisdom individually, and God, collectively for our church. God, we have huge decisions to make in the coming months. Would you give us wisdom? In Jesus' name, amen.